few things to note. Um, if you need an assisted listening device, they are available on the table to the side over there. Um, tonight's event is being streamed on Facebook Live. Um, that's on the card there. So if you have any questions or concerns, please speak with a, myself or a staff member. Um, we're still experimenting with this new space. Um, so if you're having trouble hearing in the back, uh, we recommend come on up front. Um, we should be having new speakers, unfortunately, after this event. Uh, lastly, we would like to thank the generous donors to the Cary Memorial Library Foundation and the Friends of Cary Memorial Library for making our new living room space here possible, uh, as well as programming here at the library. Um, tonight's host is Jigesh Shah, uh, Associate Professor of Systems Biology at Harvard Institutes of Medicine. He organizes Science Cafe, this series, which is dedicated to highlighting scientists and engineers and their work aiming to demystify the path of scientific discovery and innovation. Tonight, he will be interviewing Kevin Novak, the former chief of staff of the Department of Energy under the Obama administration. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Jigesh and Kevin. So I'm going to just give a little preface before we start. Just um, thank you to the foundation. Uh, and the people who donate to the foundation for providing this programming, and uh, also to Matt and uh, Megan, who is here in spirit, uh, and Corin, who uh, our library director, who kind of has always been very good about uh, kind of maintaining that community-based programming is something that you know she believes in. Um, so yes, Science Cafe is back from a long hiatus. I don't know how many people have uh, been to these before, but. Thank you for coming back. Um, I think historically this has been an opportunity to learn about a scientist or an engineer, their, uh, how they go through their careers, early influences, and then something about their work. Um, the past year has kind of helped us kind of focus on things past science. How is science used? How is science then deployed uh, kind of in the matter? We, we collect data. Uh, and we know that things like medicine and engineering can occur, but we know that there are very critical aspects of how we determine uh, governmental policy. And, um, you know, kind of I'm, I'm reminded I'm actually reading Merchants of Doubt right now, so I'm, be, I'm, I'm, I'm listening again to the questions of studied science and settled science over sulfates and acid rain and how long it took to get policy for that. But then, don't forget, you know, we went to the moon and that took a lot of money too. We sequenced the genome, that took a lot of money. So there's lots of ways that money comes from government to forward scientific progress. And sometimes those gears mesh very well and sometimes they clash. And I guess our goal today is to really get educated about how science gets into that space and how it's utilized to forward public policy. Um, and I can't really think of a better person to take us through that than, than Kevin. Um, uh, Kevin, uh, as you'll hear, is a native of Mass. He uh, lives in Arlington and uh, went to school in Massachusetts. He um, went away to DC for a while, came back to be the president of the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists um, for 10 years, uh, then pulled away as you heard, to be uh, the chief of staff for Ernie Moniz for the Department of Energy, which 17 national labs, 100,000 people, $30 billion budget, and by the way, the nuclear arsenal. Uh, so no small, it's no small job. And um, I think after a little recovery after government now, he's at the Fletcher School and is a senior research associate there. So I wanted to first thank Kevin for his public service because that's something that we kind of really, uh, um, in this day and age, thank you very much. And, and thank you for, for being here. So we usually start these things at your beginning. So I was hoping that maybe we could talk a little bit about what it was like to grow up in Mass and some of the seeds of activism and con conservationalism that might have come up kind of early on in your life. Well, thank you, uh, Jugesh, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, it's, uh, 
you didn't ask about this, but as we all know, it's appointed afternoon. Uh, and and I, I trust we'll get, we'll get we'll get into talking about Paris Agreement at some point uh, and, and the fight to address climate change. Um, so I, my family is from Massachusetts on both sides, going back generations, uh, working class immigrants, German, French, Irish. Um, my mom was from Lynn, my dad was from Malden, and uh, he built a house right next to his mother on, on Lynn Street in Malden. So my first seven years uh, were in Malden. I was one of seven kids. <clears throat> my mother was one of 11. Her mother was one of 14, so. <laughs> And uh, we have two daughters, so <laughs> we're, 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 we're trying to do our part as a population. But uh, so, family of nine, and and when I was seven, my parents bought a small cape up in Middleton, up on the North Shore, if you know that town at all. And being a family of nine in, in a three-bedroom house, I was outside every chance I got, and it was really a gift to have moved up there because. At the time, Middleton had 4,000 residents. It's, it's known for Richardson's Dairy and, and the Route 114 Drive-In, which is no longer and so on. But it was a town of cow pastures and sand pits and what we called swamps. Uh, well, of course. Um, and, um, and woods. And so I was outside every moment that I could get outside. Of course, those were the days that, it, that you know, you, you could stay outside until or your mom called you home to dinner, and then you get to go out after if you if you could talk your way into it. And so, I think that was my first connection to to nature, to the outdoors, um, uh, and and uh, sort of the freedom that comes with that, uh, and, and that feeling of, of being alive. So then, going through school early on, were there any kind of other kind of influences like mentors, people that you kind of looked at and said, you know, this is this is a career that might be fun to have. Um, I think that the, you know, kind of a, usually we have, we, sometimes we have high school students. They're busy tonight, for those of you that don't know, it's prom night. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good, thank you. The seniors are having fun, I guess. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so I think that, the, that some of the early, you know, kind of people that either in the kind of um, on TV or in government that you might have early on kind of looked to and say, oh, wow, what's going on there? You lived through a fairly turbulent time when you were in college, right? So. No, indeed. Uh, you know, the 60s were, were unfolding uh, when I was in junior high school and high school. Um, it, it was in high school, and one of the advantages of moving to, us up to Middleton is we were part of the Masconomic Regional High School District with Boxing and Tops here. So Middleton was kind of a blue collar town, and Boxing and Tops here was a town here. But, but it, 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 was a, it was a good high school. And I remember being surprised when, when a teacher took note of me. It could be a writing teacher, government teacher. And, uh, and it was interesting because a little bit of attention went such a long way. Um, but it was really in college where. Um, and I actually had, had some English teachers encourage my writing ability in high school. When I got to college, uh, it was, I started in 74, it was, it was post, you know, Watergate unfolded. Everybody wanted to be a journalist. Everybody wanted to be Woodward and Bernstein. And uh, so at UMass Amherst, uh, we actually couldn't major in journalism. Uh, the English department was alarmed by all the kids flocking over to journalism. So it was a minor. You had to be an English journalism major, um, and again, it, it, was, it, it was some faculty members who somehow, for some reason, saw something in me and encouraged developing those skills. And when I was a junior, uh, there was a great journalism professor named Larry Pinkham, who had written for Associated Press and the Chicago Sun Times, um, who you know, encouraged me to get an internship and. I, so I applied for one at the Berkshire Eagle, which at the time was a story, uh, small daily newspaper, won the Pulitzer Prize for, for, uh, for editorial writing. And, uh, and I, Larry sat me down in his office, he picked up the phone, and he called Tom Morton, the managing editor. And I think I've never seen anything like this done before. Wow. 
put him on speaker, and he said, Tom, I've got a really top-notch kid here who you need to take on as an intern. And I kid you not, what Tom said was, Larry, look, we've always taken the kids from the Ivies. We took, we took a risk on a UMass kid a couple years ago. It was a disaster. So, sorry. And so that, I'm listening to this on speaker. <laughs> and, and Larry said, no, 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 Tom, you don't understand. You've got, to, you've got to meet him. And so he acquiesced. I took the bus up and over the mountains to Pittsfield and, and uh, got the internship. And uh, I had quite an experience, my second semester junior year. And then upon graduation, uh, I called, called up my editors there and I said, I need a job. And they had an opening on the South County Press. So, it, 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 as I say, it, 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 and Larry probably did that for you know, dozens of kids over his career. But it, it, it just made a massive difference. Yeah, so I, I think that we've heard that echoed many times in a lot of these cafes is that singular kind of attention from just one or two people along your career, career trajectory can kind of influence kind of uh, what you want to do. So, so how long were you a journalist? <laughs> <laughs> I was a journalist for four and a half years. Uh, and, and, you know, and when you're young, you, you make, you know, you, you make the best decisions you can, but sometimes they're rash decisions. And what happened at the Berkshire Eagle was it was an afternoon paper when I started, which meant you could show up at 7.30 in the morning, write your stories, make your 10.30 deadline, and spend your afternoons chasing down feature stories. It flipped to a morning paper, which meant suddenly we had to work late afternoons and into the evenings every night. And I was like a, a, a 21, 22-year-old kid. <laughs> Uh, so, I had, after a couple years there, I had a chance to edit a weekly newspaper in the North Shore Weekly's chain, uh, the Swampscott Reporter, and uh, it just myself and, and, and one reporter, we had to fill this massive news hole, cover school committee and police fire and selectmen and all that. Um, and it was an incredible amount of responsibility. I, I, I was literally 23, 24, um, but we, you know, we really... I think raised the game in terms of covering the community. We, we won uh, the New England Press Association first place for general excellence in our circulation. Uh, both years I edited the paper, uh, and so, so that was that was very cool. But but going back to, to, to a youthful perspective, I increasingly uh, I guess was frustrated at being a reporter and an observer as opposed to I wanted to be on the other side, being an act being active. And helping solve problems. And the reason I say that that's a little bit of useful naivete is, you know, now I understand that you can be hugely influential as a journalist, as an editor, a producer, a, uh, you know, an on camera pundit, a columnist, uh, a report, an investigative reporter. But, uh, so, um, so I decided that, um, and also at that point, I had spent my entire life in Massachusetts, growing up here, you know, went to school here, I got my first job here. So uh, that was when I just moved down to Washington and started knocking on doors on Capitol Hill. So you worked as a legislative aide early on, is that right? And so maybe you could tell us a little bit about what that's like. That's a kind of a job that has a name, but a poor description, I think it's fair to say. Well, you know, it's a wonderful thing to, to go to Washington and work for the Congress. Um, in that, uh, first of all, some of the best and brightest, typically young people from around the country come in uh, and, and get jobs as, as uh, legislative directors, as I was, or legislative assistants, or legislative correspondents, or communications uh, for a senator or a house member. And uh, my first job was for a wonderful New York congressman, Ted Weiss. He was an Eleanor Roosevelt Democrat, uh, had this incredible story of being uh, the, the son of a Hungarian Jewish family that fled the Nazis, uh, came over to the U.S., the front end of World War II. At 18, he joined up in the Army, and he was in the infantry unit, the first U.S. soldiers to land on the ground at Hiroshima after the blast. 
and um, he, he was very progressive. Uh, his district was the west side of Manhattan, <laughs> carved out the hummus in that gerrymandering style like Chile, <laughs> all the way down to Battery Park. Um, and he had an opening for a job that was half press secretary, half legislative assistant. And because I had the press credentials, I landed the job, but very quickly realized I enjoyed the, the legislating, the policy making more. <clears throat> the other thing that happens when, when you have those jobs is you have typically a, a large portfolio. Because a, you know, a typical house member has, at least back then, you'd have 18 staff people to split between your home district and Washington. So your legislative assistants have to cover a lot of turf. So I, I was responsible for energy, environment, transportation, uh, I think the judiciary, gun control, <clears throat> all, the, all these fun issues. And uh, so I, I did that job for a couple of years. And then Tim Worth from Colorado, who had been in the House at that point 11 years, was gearing up to run for the Senate in Gary Hart's seat, because Gary Hart was gearing up to run for the for president, that ill-fated run. Um, and um, he was looking for a legislative director, which basically you're in charge of all the legislative assistants. And um, uh, so in that job, and, and so I came over in May of 85 in the House, he was elected uh, 18 months later to the Senate, and I went over to the Senate with him as his legislative director and was with him for several years there. Um, and. I mean, that, that was, it was a high pressure job, but, but it was really cool because now I had to know about a little bit about everything and lean on my staff to help educate me. And uh, one of the particular challenges is that the, the rule that Tim had, <clears throat> you know, typically when, the, when there's a vote on the floor of the Senate, the bells ring, meaning the Senate office bells. And you know you have 20 minutes to get your senator to the floor to vote. And the rule was, uh, we weren't allowed to interrupt him if he was in a committee hearing or a meeting in his office or whatever it might be until six minutes before the end of the vote. And that meant we had to hike all the way across to, to the Capitol building, the Senate floor. And he is like six, three or six, four. And he would stride at a real pace. I was literally jogging next to him. I'd have five minutes to say, this is what this vote is. Here's the pros and cons. Here's what people in Colorado think. And we, rest, we the legislators, asked, think you should vote yes. And if he said, no, I want to vote no, <laughs> then I 60 seconds to appeal. <laughs> and then go back and face my, my legislative staff. So that tells you a little bit about kind of, I, I don't think it's that different now in the current news cycle. So as we start, or as we start thinking about advocacy, that's where we're going to get to in this. And Advocacy, if you've got five minutes to tell your legislative, you know, kind of a representative, you better have the core message down. You better have kind of the points um, well articulated. So, so there was a lot of science already in your portfolio at this point. And so the question then is, you know, kind of how did you get picked up? Uh, how did you connect with the Union of Friends of Los Angeles? Was that the first thing that you did out of D.C.? or? Were there other uh, stops along the way? Uh, well, actually, UCS was the first thing. I, I worked for UCS twice in my career for a total of 17 years. And the first opportunity was um, uh, my first daughter was born in 1989. I was looking for something of a little more sane pace. Union Concerned Scientists had an opening in its Washington office for a legislative director for arms control and national security. And the reason I qualify for that is that I've always believed in the, in the player coach model. That in one's career, you often rise up through the management ranks. And to my mind, being 100% manager is, is often not a fully utilizing one's skills because by the time you become at you know, that point in your career, you have a lot of knowledge, you have a lot of relationships, uh, you have a lot of experience. And so I always wanted an issue that I could call my own. And, in the case of Tim, in Colorado, it was the nuclear weapons production complex. We had, at the time, the Rocky Flats plant. And if you know anything about the nuclear weapons production complex, this is something that came about after the Manhattan Project. Industrial scale facilities around the country that made different components 
of our nuclear weapons. And uh, in the case of Rocky Flats, they fabricated plutonium pits, which is a central element of the warhead, uh, and also uh, beryllium parts and, and some other pieces. That was their mission, big sprawling facility. That also had a lot of problems. They had had some accidental releases of radiation over time. They had um, uh, workers, uh, retired workers were getting pneumoniosis, awful degenerative lung disease from the beryllium uh, machine shop. Uh, some solvents were, were from the motor pool was leaking down into the drinking water, etc. So uh, I took on that issue, and then of course it had a role in the nuclear weapons arsenal. And and as we discovered all the needs associated with that facility, we started paying attention to the entire complex, places like the Pantex facility in Texas, or Savannah River reactors in in uh, South Carolina, or Hanford. Washington State, uh, and so on, as well as the national security labs like Los Alamos, and discovering that the Cold War buildup under Ronald Reagan was so aggressive in pushing what was largely at that point a pretty antiquated industrial set of facilities that the needs were, were, were extraordinary. At the same time, we were starting to get some traction in arms control, where we were going to start to reduce the size of the arsenal. So that was my baptism, and, and it was that work that allowed me to qualify for that position at UCS. Uh, and, uh, and that was the time of the Strategic Defense Initiative, Star Wars, which we had great concerns about, about the B-2 stealth bomber, which we, with our coalition partners, uh, uh, led, designed and led a campaign that actually convinced the Congress to end funding for the B-2 uh, over a two-year campaign. I mean, it's probably, it may be the only major uh, weapon program that, that that's ever been canceled uh, as a result of direct advocacy over such a short period of time. Yeah, so it's interesting that you mentioned SDI Star Wars. We recently had some uh, activity in that realm, uh, shooting down uh, other missiles. Um, so, uh, but that that does bring up this idea of science because there was a good deal of science around SDI. There was a good deal of science scientists that said this couldn't be done, and. <coughs> The question of how does that kind of science get injected into the policy making is kind of one of the first, you know, kind of the, the first realm that as a scientist myself, I'm very interested in. How is the data actually used? How is it presented? And what are the other inputs that then might sideline science in that context? And so in the UCS, you must have had to deal with, with this quite a bit. No, and, and Star Wars is a great example because you remember President Reagan had this vision that we could essentially uh, shoot down, shoot, shoot an incoming bullet with a ball, right? This notion that uh, we could defend against incoming uh, missiles, uh, ICBMs and the like, um, from from space-based platforms, and, and it indeed was a scientist, Edward Teller, uh, who who put those thoughts in his head. But most of the science community, certainly the physics community, um, and, and, and you know, the, the aerospace engineering community and so on, they knew better. They, they knew how challenging that, that is. And to this day, with our uh, missile defense initiative, uh, we, we, we have not yet shown we can reliably shoot down a missile with a missile. Uh, you know, or, or, projectile or whatever. So that was a great case where the, you know, the president found a scientist, right, uh, or the scientist found him, and launched that out into the world, and then it fell to us at the Union for the Same Scientists to make the counter case. Now you have to be careful because, you know, frankly, we, it would be lovely to be able to defend our nation against, uh, say, a crazy North Korean dictator who is on the cusp of having both miniaturizing a functioning uh, thermonuclear warhead and, and an ICBM and kind of ballistic missiles that could reach our shores. And, and so it, it, it wasn't so much the aspiration, although and then there, there were arms control considerations as well. But it, but it was this, it was this uh, uh, over projection of what science was capable of today and what was likely to be capable of, and then basing the security of our nation on that.
So for those of you that Teller makes a number of appearances as the uh, as the ear, as the whispering in Reagan's ear. Uh, Teller himself was the uh, developer of the fusion device, the thermonuclear device. So he was held in high regard, and there was a group of physicists I, I, I gather that had this uh, role, and they. Uh, they actually make themselves visible in a number of ways over the course of acid rain. Um, uh, some of that actually is predated, uh, predates some of the tobacco uh, lobbying. So the, you know, the tactics here, we'll talk a little bit about efficacy from the political side, but it's worth mentioning that science doesn't always speak with one voice, right Jay? <laughs> I'm quoting Jay Kaufman there, but it's an important it's an important question to bring up is that um, science advocacy doesn't only come from the political side. We need to also be able to suss out uh, the science itself. So at UCS, so I have a, I have a, I don't want to kind of preempt the book that you're probably going to be writing because you must have a lot of stories. But what are some of the things that you that you had to deal with at UCS that kind of really um, kind of stridently had to, you had to take on advocacy uh, of the scientists against political elements. Uh, well, you, hopefully all of you are members of the Union of Concerned Scientists. I'm, I can say that, I'm not president anymore, but it's a fabulous organization. And, um, and it was a great privilege to, to uh, be its president. So just yeah. complete, that, complete that timeline. So I was there for three years uh, in 1993, uh, went off and did other things, came back to UCS in Cambridge in 2000 as the number two, and then uh, in 2000, uh, beginning of 2004, became the president. Oh, you did get a degree in the middle there somewhere, somewhere you went to school, like that, right? I, I got a mid-career degree at Kennedy School. Yeah, yeah, so one of the MPAs, right? So That's or, right. Right, right, right. That's right. So you do go back to school. This always comes up at one of these science cafes. Go to college, and then you stay in college or go back to college. And most of the parents are like, what? <laughs> yeah, you spend a lot of time in school. Well, and by the way, what I focused on uh, in the career masters was economics, natural resource economics, in part because through my career at that point, people were always making economic arguments to me, and, and you know, the old, uh, politically incorrect Harry Truman comment about giving me a one on the Congress. Why, Mr. President? Because whenever the Congress comes in here, they always say, on the one hand, Mr. President, on the other hand. And, and so I wanted to be exposed to economic theory. I wasn't going to make any economics because I was a short master's, but, but uh, that's why I went. I wanted to kind of take those skills. But at UCS, it was, it was interesting because, because I, I'm not a scientist. Um, and so to be the president of the science based organization was, was, um, it was wonderful, but could be challenging in that respect. My board of directors was all scientists, engineers, economists, uh, energy policy experts. Uh, it wasn't, when I inherited it, it wasn't a fundraising board, it was very much a technical board. And certainly much of our staff and all of our programs, we had a lot of technical ability, and many of our members were as well. And, but the biggest challenge was by any measure, we were an advocacy organization. And scientists rightfully are very concerned about being seen as advocates because uh, the scientific method, uh, science itself, is rooted in objectivity and open-mindedness and, and, and the pursuit of the truth and, and, and knowledge and constantly, constantly testing and pressing back on on, on uh, what is considered to be uh, uh, that brick of knowledge or that brick of knowledge. And so we, we, we tried to navigate that. And, you know, there are all these science, um, I thought it was trade associations, but you know, the, the, the American Physical Society, the uh, Geological, Geophysics uh, Union, and so on, uh, their job is to represent the scientific discipline on matters of policy funding, et cetera, uh, uh, and, and they're, they're very needed. Then you have groups like the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, um, and, and that kind of tier of organization. Um, by the way, it's now headed up by Rush Holt, the former, uh, former uh, longtime House member from New Jersey, uh, 
uh, and, and the only tragedy is he was one of the very few scientists in the, in the house, and that was not in the house until the AAAS. So that, that was always a big, interesting challenge. Um, and we, and we, we tried to be careful in, in, in terms of how we did that, but we were also very, uh, very assertive in, um, in, in undertaking you know, rigorous analysis around a, a series of questions. And, and, and then uh, being very transparent about the methodology that we would use. So uh, uh, who, who, we didn't always do traditional peer review, but we always had some level of review who the reviewers were. Um, what the assumptions were, so that anybody could poke, poke at it. And, and so we tried to respect that. Um, and, and we weren't above, uh, we weren't above uh, challenging somebody in our own orbit. And here's an example of that is we had, uh, and UCS still does, a food and environment program. And uh, in the, during the years that I was with the organization, the early years, it was focused on genetic engineering of, of plants and animals. Um, the, a lot of the scientists who were involved in genetic engineering of plants and animals at places like Cornell were pretty bullish about that technology. They really envisioned that you could engineer drought-resistant crops um, or disease-resistant um, uh, you know, food animals, uh, farm animals. Um, or integrate in pesticide into a, into a crop, so you don't have to spray pesticide. And there was a there was a, a grad student who had not yet. Uh, oh no, no I, I think this was maybe it was a young assistant science professor at Cornell did not yet have tenure, who did this experiment around uh, monarch butterflies and milkweed. Milkweed grows often uh, on the edges, the succession in a succession of plumes, on the edges of cornfields. The soy fields and monarch butterflies rely on rely on the uh, milkweed pollen. And he did this experiment after it, it, it after this be so-called beachy corn plant had been the crop had been planted, having this beachy uh, pesticide integrated into the, into the plant. And but just through a single reproductive season, which is very short couple weeks time and it doesn't come back for another year for monarch butterflies, determined, his data showed that that BT corn uh, dramatically reduced the reproductive functions of these butterflies. He decided to rush that um, based on one set of data, one season into publication. And there was this hue and cry out of the uh, the, the related faculty at Cornell, where this was a, this was a major discipline. And our board chair at the time, Kurt Godfrey, physics professor, is at Cornell, so his colleagues were giving him hell. And so Kurt said, all right, we, you know, we, we called together like this little mini symposium out of Cornell, invited that, that young professor to present his, 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 his findings, others presented work, and uh, it was determined that, that that was shoddy science or inadequate science. And it was very painful uh, that that particular young scientist did not get tenure. But that never left me because I like how, you know, when people say that, you know, science is rigged or something like that, they don't know the science community. A, a UCS board meeting, you would think it was the rudest group of people that ever was assembled. <laughs> yeah, right, at each other, arguing, you know, that's not true. But that's, that's the spirit of science. It's such a rigorous thing to actually get, get a piece of science, and scientists here know this, through to, to, to peer review publication and, and generally accept it because of that rigor. And, uh, and I also appreciated that we, we would call, call out some of our own work. And, and the reason we were involved with this particular young scientist is the Food Environment Program, which was headed up by, by, a, by a food scientist, actually promoted his work. And raised dramatically raised the profile on it, and that was partly why Kurt was there originally. Yeah, so so that, that's a great example of you know you you brought scientists together to kind of convene about a particular um, question, and, and and I guess one of the interfaces that's really interesting to understand is the UCS UCS is now interfacing with the government in some way, 
and you guys are producing work product or you're producing some kind of deliverables that have to get somehow make their way to that legislative aide that's running beside that senator, right, and has the five minutes to convince him one way or the other, or her or the other way. Um, and they're probably in Ubers now, they probably don't walk anymore, I think. But <laughs> either way, what, but, so how did that work? How did that, I think that that's the, that's the nuts and bolts underneath all of this stuff, right? How does it diffuse in to the, in, into the governmental organization? Our model was what I call full service shop. That a lot of the best science really doesn't get the attention of policymakers because scientists, engineers, you know, they're not trained. Uh, either they're not trained to kind of communicate and, and, and get that work out there, or that's not their primary interest. Their primary interest is, is discovery. And so what we built, and, and the model was there uh, before. Uh, before I uh, worked at UCS, but we really bulked it up, is that the core always was a major analytical product. It could be a very significant report. It could, it could have authors from the board staff, outside scientists, but it was always a, 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 it could be a shorter analytical piece, but it was always a piece of analysis. And we didn't do a lot of uh, original research. It was all often drawing on other research and then layering in some, some robust analysis trying to answer some questions. But then we had a, a crack legislative staff that often had worked on Capitol Hill or worked in the state capitol or worked in a governor's office and knew how, how it worked. And you know, a good, a good public interest lobbyist knows exactly what that harried uh, legislative aide or that harried member of Congress rushing to the vote really means. They need to know who's who's on either side of the issue. They, they can hear all your pro arguments, but you better be ready to tell them what the other side of the other other arguments are and what your rebuttals are to them. And you better do it all very succinctly. So, a legislative staff, an organizing staff. Uh, our membership was uh, only about forty percent scientists and technical people, and the rest were people who supported the mission of bringing strong science to public policy. They might be a high school science teacher, or they, 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 they might work as a lab technician, or not. And so those, that, those were our ground troops, and we could organize them to, to write letters, or make phone calls, or show up in a, in, in a, in a district town hall, even though another conference came on. Um, but then we had a communication staff, and obviously as over those years when the internet was breaking, we had to get smart about that. Um, and, and then we would work in coalition. Uh, often with other science and technical groups, other environmental groups, uh, or in the nuclear weapons area, nuclear security with the uh, so-called peace and security community, uh, uh, etc. So, so you got to see the side of pushing science into the government, and then it sounds like you, could, you jumped over the wall, and now you are going to be the recipient of this. So, so that must have been something to kind of show up as chief of staff, if you will. What was that like? Well, it's, it's funny, and, and I like Nicole is here tonight. Is Nicole? Uh, Nicole knows this, what I'm about to say is, first of all, I, I, when I, you know, when, when you're trying to get a job in the uh, presidential administration, uh, as, as I was after, after the 2012 real act, uh, once you have the White House interested in you, in my case, the nominee of the energy sector, the media. then you go through a vetting process, a rigorous scrubbing by the FBI, uh, I mean, you know, you make your criminal record, your mental health, your finances, your taxes, the whole thing. And you can't get a job opportunity to survive that. So I was in this rough position. I've been president of UCS for 10 years. I've been there for 14 years. Um, and so when I was put in the bed, I said to the president of the personnel office, and the way I said, I've got to be able to at least tell my board of directors that I'm in consideration for this because I knew once I cleared that and had to come off, I'd be gone. And, um, and 
and it's not a simple thing to walk away from at that time of 25 years out of the which I had such a long, uh, incredible relationship. And so they said, that, that's okay, I have to do that. But then they would, they thought it too soon. And I was about six weeks out from what ultimately was when I left to go to the government. I cleared that for anyone of you right away, and I was there two weeks later. And it was at that two week juncture that I told my donors, my members, and the vast majority of myself. And so it was exceedingly abrupt and kind of like whiplash. And then I arrived at this big swelling agency with a big swelling commission. Now, remember, I, I, going back to my time on the Hill, when I was 25, throughout my career, I tracked the mission of the Department of Energy. I worked on nuclear weapons reduction, nuclear security, and operation. I worked on clean energy and climate change. And I thought I knew that agency, but as the call knows, I, I call her up and say, I don't know who these people are in my office. And I don't, I don't know what those acronyms are. <laughs> oh my God, we, we're responsible for the strategic petroleum research. <laughs> I mean, they tell me that. And, and we're licensing the liquefied natural gas export. Why? Tell them all that. And it was a totally cap, you know, what's your name And, uh, uh, you know, you don't get to see that exact after a bit, but it, 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 all of that was just such a rush. On top of that, I. Uh, they didn't start my, my get to do a whole lot of scrub with the security department. And DOE is a major national security agency. And so the first three months, I was, well, that was, that then happened. I didn't have my security plans, so I was chief of staff in the agency. It really, I just couldn't believe it, how important it was to have those plans just so that I could do my job as a So you arrive, there's a remarkable amount of activity. And you know, you get sea lights under you. But what were some of the surprises? I think that, you know, in our discussion previously, one of the things that you pointed at was with the national lights. Right? They're, they're, they have purview over these 17 remarkable groups of governmental scientists that are, you know, responsible for a lot of what goes into this thing, for example. You know, like these guys have done kind of remarkable things behind the scenes, not in the technology community. What was that like? Because these guys are going to produce science that we're ultimately going to talk about how how to do it. So what was it? What was the international event? It was wonderful. It was you know, remarkable. We have these 17 national labs that are, that are uh, under the Department of Energy purview. Uh, four of them are so-called national security labs: uh, Argonne, Los Alamos, San Diego, and Los Alamos. The others are primarily energy. Kind of thing. They um, they're, they're quasi independent, and the whole you know the whole uh, uh, kind of business model of the Department of Energy is that all of those labs, save one, the uh, the National Technology uh, Labs in West Virginia, Pittsburgh, which is government owned, government run. All the others are government owned, but uh, contractor run. And this goes back to the Manhattan Project. Remember the dollar a year corporations, the dollar a year men, um, where uh, the American corporation would basically run all facilities. So all of the labs save one, all the nuclear weapons production facilities, uh, all of the uh, uh, nuclear uh, waste cleanup sites are all run by U.S. corporations or consortia, consortia uh, of U.S. corporations. And it's a fascinating model. And, and in every one of those sites and labs, there's a federal site office where there's a, a team there that basically kind of oversees and, and helps as a conduit back to headquarters. So uh, I haven't talked much about Secretary Moniz, um, who is not only a phenomenal physicist, but a tremendous uh, uh, leader, manager, bureaucratic infighter. He was an undersecretary in the second Clinton term uh, at Energy. And uh, one of the things that we discovered, he got there in, in May of 2013, I, I was on board a month later. We, what we discovered that the morale at the national labs 
around the relationship with DOE and particularly headquarters was very low. And uh, it was, I think it got a little bit better under Secretary Chu because Secretary Chu, our predecessor, had been the director of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So he had that lab director's perspective. But even so, they didn't feel connected. And so one of the first things Ernie did was he created a lab, he created two entities, a lab policy council and a lab operations board. And they were what it sounds like, one, one working on policy related to uh, federal science and, and, uh, and, and, the, and the labs vis-a-vis -vis the agency, and the other operational issues, budget and facilities and all that kind of thing. And on each of these, a subset of the national directors were enlisted to serve, plus a subset of the senior leadership of DOE. And, um, and that, it got tremendous results. Uh, and, and the working relationship just, and you know, they have a monthly meeting and phone calls, and, and from that, you know, various, various policies uh, with Chris Bob problems would, would get solved. So it, 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 the, they are the, the crown jewels uh, of, of, uh, of federal science. They, um, uh, Ernie would often say that it's the largest single investment in uh, discovery science in the physical sciences, uh, not only in the country, but probably the world. So I guess one of the things that we wanted to get to at some point was this idea of what you, one of your big legislative items towards the end of your kind of time there. Um, I'm sure people would love to hear what it was like to be sitting around on November 8th when uh, you realize you're going to hand over the two little keys that you get to blow up stuff with yes. and over to somebody else. Uh, How'd you but, know there were two little keys? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't have clearance. I'm just guessing. I saw it on the internet. Um, <laughs> but I think that, that one of the questions that, that we've talked about before, and I think that really comes to the core of this, is how does one keep the science you know, from being manipulated, suppressed in the context of science. I think I'll just give one example for those of you that have a chance, go check out a recent um, house um, event where Lamar Smith, he's the chairman of the Science and Technology Committee, ran something on the scientific method and climate change. It's I didn't recognize the scientific method in his, <laughs> his uh, articulation of it. But it really, what it drove home to me is that, you know, he's a chairman of a committee, he can bring anybody he wants in to talk about climate change, and he just picks cherry picks. And that's the science that people are gonna see. And when you only have five minutes to convince somebody walking down the street, how do we, how do we prevent that from happening? Well, one of the most important techniques that has emerged is, is insisting that every agency uh, develop a scientific integrity policy that provides protection to government scientists, but also clear ground rules for how, uh, for you know, when a sci government scientist can, can uh, when they're speaking out publicly, when is it official, when is it personal, how, when they can use, when can they use social media, when do they have to get approvals, all of that. And this goes back to, to my time as president of the Union of Concerned Scientists when President George W. Bush was in office, where the science community was in, in an uproar because there was active efforts to suppress science by government scientists, editing you know, scientific papers uh, uh, in a way, by, by lay people, political people, uh, in a way that was, was, was totally out of line, um, uh, insisting that federal scientists couldn't present their papers at conferences. That's the lifeblood of any scientist, uh, or publish in a, in a peer-reviewed journal. So we, we first created something called the Restoring Scientific Integrity uh, Program. And then on my watch, we, we, that morphed into the Center for Science and Democracy, uh, which you, if you haven't checked out, you, I encourage you to. It's, it's really phenomenal. Um, that 
one of the things that the Center for Science and Democracy started doing was grading the federal agencies on their scientific integrity policy. And so I brought with me the report card that was done in uh, March of 2015. So I'm now the, the, uh, the chief of staff at the, at the Department of Energy. And they gave the Department of, of Energy, of which I'm the chief of staff, former president of UCS, uh, we got a C for social media policy and probably even more bruising for the, the scientists and faculty in the room and incomplete <laughs> for media policy. And, uh, and I had known from the time, earlier report cards at DOE had had a terrible, uh, a terrible record, but, you know, Stephen Chu, a Nobel winning physicist, was the Secretary of Energy starting in 2009. He just, you know, candidly did not make this a priority. And uh, so this, this was a kick, kick in the pants for me personally, and uh, I, I had actually made a couple runs internally. You know, it's not always easy, even as a chief of staff, to move a big bureaucracy. But I, I just was determined, before we left office, we were going to raise our grade. And um, working with the chief scientist in the National Nuclear Security Administration, the nuclear side of the house, uh, Dmitry Kuznetsov, uh, and then also uh, Cherry Murray, who's at, the, the, who's at Harvard, but she came in as the director of the Office of Science. And then uh, Lynn Orr, who's a subsurface uh, expert, scientist himself, our undersecretary for science and energy, I, we put that little group together, and we just determined we were going to write a strong policy. And uh, I was pleased to say I checked it online today. It's still on the DOE website. Uh, I think it's now best in class. Uh, the, uh, UCS has not yet corrected their grade, uh, and so I've been on the horn to them to get them to take a fresh look at it. But it, it, it really is terrific. I just want to read to you, um, if I may, um, the first lines of the policy. The cornerstone of the scientific integrity policy at DOE is that all scientists, engineers, and others supported by DOE are free and encouraged to share their scientific findings and views. This includes federal staff, including the heads of departmental elements and heads of field elements. Scientists and engineers at DOE laboratories and field sites, other contractors who support the R&D mission, and financial assistance recipients. These personnel are also free to share their personal views and opinions on scientific or technical related policy matters, provided they do not attribute these views to the U.S. government. This is a secretarial directive, which is very hard to overturn. It would really take Secretary Perry uh, personally getting involved to make this happen. This is for the first time this policy applies to the 17 national labs, which is frankly where the lion's share of, of uh, probably 20,000 scientists work. And, um, and it's great because it's, it, it gives protection to scientists, but also to managers. There's a, there's a, there's a dispute resolution process in here. Um, there's, uh, it's, it's very clear when you, when, if you're doing something officially, you, you have to run it up through channels. Uh, you know, this isn't, you know, it's, it's not academia. It's the federal government, and it's taxpayer supported, so there are certain rules. But the whole emphasis is on freedom of expression, uh, it, it, it protects scientists' ability to publish, to present at conferences, to participate in conferences, to be active on social media. So I'm very proud of it, and uh, I'm just, I just want my grade to rise. <laughs> yeah, it's always hard to do, undo that incomplete. I'm, I'm, a, I'm never really very uh, I'm generous with that. But, uh, but it is, it, 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 it does seem like this allows you to control kind of the DOE scientists. But there's a larger question that comes up, which is the one of science um, coming in, you know, from a variety of sources, whether they're governmental or they're, um, you know, uh, even industrial, you know, a variety of places where science will come in, has to be evaluated. And I guess there are two big issues. One is, how do you prevent the perversion of that, that scientific result? 
is there a way to kind of increase integrity in the context of the policymakers themselves? And then the other one is, how do you deal with the lack of consensus on the scientific issue? And how do, how do politicians, who are not scientists themselves, have to parse that out? So, I don't know, there's two big issues, but maybe, you know, maybe we take the first one and see where we go from there. <laughs> Um, actually, if I may, oh, sure. so the second one, just because, um, you know, scientists are loath to say anything with great certainty. The Intergover Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the last big assessment, concluded, and this is the most far-reaching statement that they had ever made, that it was 99, excuse me, 97% certain that humans were driving climate change. And you can imagine a policy maker, particularly on you know the, the less informed side, say, "See, they're not sure." You know, they're just, <laughs> but for a scientist, that's as close. That's as close as you're going to get to certainty, and it's pretty damn certain. So, it's so, which is to say that if there's if there's true debate in the science community and it is not subtle, um, then that is very hard for policymakers, and that frankly maybe they shouldn't be legislating on a particular point of question uh, and until the science uh, community has a chance to, to, to see that through. But I say that knowing that science has never forgotten, right? Um, but one of the things that I always try to convey to policymakers who, who buy into some of these, these loose, you know, pejoratives about science and scientists being on the take, you know, they're betting, profiting, you know, you know, I, I've never seen it, you know, it's rare, I think, that somebody goes into science to, to get rich because most of them uh, probably end up getting paid 50 cents on the hour by the time they get out of the lab. Um, uh, but what I always try to, to, to convey to policymakers is the scientific method uh, is not perfect, and I'm paraphrasing, I forget who said this, but I don't think it was Churchill. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's the best system we have for pursuing and identifying the truth. And if you think about, by the time science places that a, a brick into the wall of knowledge, think about what kiln it's been through. You know, the scientific method is about articulating a hypothesis and then testing that hypothesis and then gathering evidence and then replicating that experiment, very, very key piece of it. And then exposing it to peer review by peers who are deeply knowledgeable in your field, in your domain. And that's all transparent, who's doing the peer review. And then submitting it to a, to a peer review journal, which is highly selective and has its own selection criteria. And then when it's out in the world, it, um, it, it may uh, then, 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 it, then the rest of the scientific community is going to poke it and, and push on it, and if and 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 you know you can make your name in science if you can find a serious error in somebody else's work. And I'll never forget Kurt Godfrey, uh, who's now chairman emeritus at UCS. When I mentioned Kurt at Cornell, he remembered a a calculation mistake that he and Henry Kendall went on to win the Nobel, and, and, and he was a, he preceded Kurt as chair. 20 years, had made in a early, I think it was an anti-satellite weapon piece of analysis they did in the early days of UCS. And they realized it and corrected it, but he never forgot. That stung. And he's now, you know, 85 years old. So, so I think part of what's missing in this is, is frankly, people don't understand the scientific method. And, and, and I, I know we try to teach that in school. But maybe there's, there's an adult ed version of that where, where we, can, we can help people, remind people about what, what when we talk about science, what, what it means. And, and, and I think that might give some confidence. So I, I think that's a great kind of conclusion to this, you know, kind of like the adult ed version of scientific method. We'll, we'll work on it. We'll work on it. But I, let's thank Kevin. I'm going to open up for Q&A, but thank you so much, Kevin. So um, Matt and you'll be going.
Kate will be coming around with microphones for questions. For questions. So um, speak into the microphone, and that way we'll all be able to hear you. You went back to school in public policy. Did you ever think about going back in the sciences because it's what you've been dealing with? Uh, in all honesty, not seriously. Um, but but I you know I, I love science. Um, uh, I uh, obviously am drawn to the nexus of science and policy. Uh, I love the natural world. I never I don't have the memory for. For, to be a naturalist, uh, my wife Nicole does. Uh, and so I love walking through the woods with her because she, she'll, she'll tell me what that plant is or what that bird call is. Um, uh, but also, uh, and, and may, maybe, maybe this is, this is uh, too unambitious, but my high school physics uh, professor, uh, uh, professor, uh, uh, physics teacher, Larry Morris once told me in great frustration that I couldn't algebra my way out of a paper bag. <laughs> uh, there's good mentors and then there's unmentors. Yeah. <laughs> but I, but I did I, I, I took algebra uh, one twice because I was stubborn and, uh, and and did get a B finally. But um, so so no and, uh, and and unlikely. But what I did I did focus on economics and particularly natural resource economics in grad school. Which is, uh, as you know, the discipline, the dismal science is highly quantitative. So I, I was I was put through the paces, and and I did get an A in, that, in, in several of my economics courses. Does the does the government have a long term strategy for nuclear power development? Oh, what a great question. Um, I would say no. Um, there, there are efforts to support the development of advanced nuclear reactor technology, uh, primarily at the Department of Energy, um, through the Office of Nuclear Energy, and there's, there's a significant uh, uh, R&D uh, grant program there. Uh, there's some work in the national labs. Um, there is, uh, there are other programs to to encourage the development of, of, of new generation of advanced reactors. The first uh, nuclear reactors in 30 years are being built in South Carolina and in Georgia today, the so-called Vogel reactors. They're, they're Westinghouse AP1000s, which are advanced light water reactors. And the advanced part comes in uh, somewhat less Exposure to, uh, to to a, a series of events leading to a meltdown, a a, a, a smaller uh, waste stream, and so so certain elements. Um, those are being built, at least the South Carolina, the two South Carolina reactors with uh, loans from the DOE loan program, the low market loan guarantees, um, and they should be completed and online in the next few years. They I had said, you know, in my time at UCS, that they, the test will be whether they're built on time and on budget. Well, they're not, they're, they're beyond on time and on budget. <clears throat> but that will be a test because um, what those ultimately cost, whether the communities around those reactors feel safe, um, uh, whether they, they, they work well and generate electricity well, that's all going to be a big determinant of whether we continue to build. A conventional style style of reactor. You know, seven years ago we had 104 operating reactors in this country. Today it's down to like 97. There's an, uh, several more that are going to close. Uh, the Pilgrim uh, nuclear power plant here in Massachusetts is slated to close in a couple of years. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> Uh, and, and so the, the, the industry, which at 104 reactors was providing about 20% of our country's electricity, is, is at a, a real pivotal point. Can, can, can we make a case for additional modern reactors, or are we going to see this contraction of nuclear generation over time? As, as somebody deeply concerned about, I mean, I, I have my share of concerns about whether we can operate, uh, particularly the current generation of nuclear reactors, safely. Um, 
and securely. But as somebody who is deeply worried about climate change, I am also worried as we lose that capacity, because a typical nuclear reactor generates 1,200 to 1,500 megawatts. Uh, that's a big, you know, that, that's a large cluster of very large wind farms. And it's a massive, you know, a, a massive uh, solar development uh, that would go on beyond what we could see. That is to say, it's challenging to replace it. Um, and so here in Massachusetts, just today, the Brayton Point coal power, fire power plant down in uh, Swanson. Hmm? Yeah, um, just closed. And that's a good thing. It was fired by coal and oil. Um, but as and we closed Salem Harbor a couple years ago, as we shut down our coal generation, and then we shut down our nuclear, um, and there's, there's a fair amount of opposition to bringing in another natural gas pipeline, that puts a lot of emphasis then on renewables. And there's a lot of opposition to land-based wind in this state. There is this offshore wind uh, that's coming on fast. Um, it also puts pressure on demand side, reducing demand. But we're, 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 Massachusetts is the most efficient state in the country for five straight years. We're doing a good job there. There's more to do. But we're, we're all of which is to illustrate that the nuclear question is an important one. The, the last thing I'll say is another program at UCS, not, excuse me, at DOE, um, was around small modular reactors. And there's some very interesting technology that, that nuclear engineers are very excited about, so different cuts of the technology to build these small modular reactors that have passive safety uh, features so that they, they can't melt down, that generate far less nuclear waste, et cetera. And you, you can imagine you still have security issues. In fact, but security issues are heightened because with a big complex, in a sense, it's almost easier to protect. Um, but that's an interesting thing. DOE actually has a relatively modest program. It's about $400 million a year to support two different technologies that want a competitive process to help them prepare their NRC licenses. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will entertain those licenses for, for the first time, and they're getting ready to host those. So, uh, JR mentioned uh, just recently reading The Merchants of Doubt. <laughs> and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, how you can be successful advocating for policy in an environment where well-funded organizations like ALEC are sowing doubt about uh, science, and maybe you could tell a story about where you were successful and perhaps some lessons we might be able to learn from that. Uh, it's a great question, and, and if you haven't read uh, Rebecca Oreski's book, Merchants of Doubt, uh, see if there's a copy here at the library before you go home. It's a great, it's a great account, and uh, you know it, it tells that story of the tobacco industry, which uh, uh, you know well beyond when the medical community had had this enormous evidence that smoking tobacco could cause lung cancer and respiratory disease. The tobacco industry was able to suppress that science and and squeeze out. I don't know, two more decades, frankly, of death. And, um, and it, it, it's, it's an atrocious story. Both, both of my parents were heavy smokers. Uh, neither died of lung cancer, but they both had lung cancer uh, and uh, late in their life. Um, uh, and uh, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. We, um, but the way, the, way, the way that science won out was persistence. It was persistence, and, and it was the medical community that, that, that would not give up. And, and then, frankly, I think over time, more and more policymakers lost loved ones uh, to, to that scourge. One of the things we did at UCS in the Restoring Scientific Integrity Project was uh, uh, we decided, and I, and I, I ordered this up, I, I wanted to, Greenpeace had, had taken a look at ExxonMobil, and they're, they're uh, highly successful efforts to suppress climate science and to underwrite groups that, that, that sow doubt. Uh, but for better or worse, being Greenpeace, they didn't get any traction, or much traction, certainly among mainstream uh, elected officials. 
And so I thought, you know, let's put UCS's credibility and reputation on the line, and let's do our own uh, study and research. And uh, and so we we so it, it was in the form, I suppose, a replication of an experiment. And uh, we found out even more stuff about how ExxonMobil had, had, had done that, who they had funded, we mapped it all out, and we and we launched it, and it, and it hit like a you know it hit like a a large explosive. It really caught on, and and uh, and, and ExxonMobil. Uh, they, what they, within a half an hour of our posting and launching this, issued a statement denying everything. An hour later, they rescinded because somebody in the C-suite said, we can't say that. We can't compound, you know, basically our sins by denying that we didn't do this. It was, we, had, we, had, we, we had it documented. And, um, and, and, and I think that, I don't want to, Take too much credit here for UCS, but I think that put Exxon Mobil on a course where uh, they they started distancing themselves. They, they, believe me, they're not angels uh, in this regard, but they they distanced them. They cut off funding for some of these groups. They distanced themselves. They they started putting out uh, uh, pro climate action statements, uh, and and then you you saw that that Rex Tillerson, the ex CEO, uh, who's the Secretary of State was the leading champion trying to argue to stay to the president we should stay in the Paris Agreement. Exxon Mobil was among the major US corporations in a very high profile way that argued we should, we should stay uh, uh, in the agreement. And the other interesting thing, uh, Nicole and I both have worked on sh corporate shareholder resolutions around climate change, that Exxon Mobil just had its annual meeting. And it used to, you know, when we were working on it, if we got, you know, 6% or 7% of the shareholders to vote for a pro-action on climate change uh, resolution, we felt you know, that was progress. Uh, was it 62%? Voted to approve, and, and made major uh, institutional investors to approve that resolution in ExxonMobil. So, yeah, I, there are probably other examples, and I'll think about them, but that's one where, uh, and, and of course, there's a whole campaign against ExxonMobil. There are many actors uh, in that space, but but I think we were able to embarrass that, that company into somewhat better uh, behavior and more responsible behavior. Thanks for uh, coming tonight. I really enjoyed hearing a little bit about your history because I was at the US Arms Control and Disarmament Agency about the same time you were at UCS and I'm a former Department of Energy employee that had the pleasure of representing DOE at the US mission to the International Atomic Energy Agency. I you know, worked with Undersecretary Moniz at that time on the EATER project. And one of the things I was always um, a little bit frustrated about, not only that the public knows so little about many things that DOE does and the breadth of its programs, but also about the state of science education. I'm not a trained scientist either. I came more from the, you know, from the liberal arts uh, into, into science. And I know DOE has great programs, the Science Bowl and, and science fairs and other things, but um, one, what, what do you think can be done more? I mean, not only for the department to increase public understanding of the many things that it does, but also contribute not just to adult education. We have a problem with uh, student education in science, and we see you know, the effects of that not only in our very undereducated Congress, uh, who has very little uh, understanding on science issues, but certainly the public as a whole, who are voters in our democracy and have really, I think, very little appreciation for scientific expertise. Uh, so what, what do you think can be done, not just by DOE, but by the US government as a whole, to try to promote better uh, science literacy? That's a great question, and uh, but let me first say that uh, I won't say this was a surprise, but, but one of the great pleasantries of coming into DOE and serving for the three and a half years that I did was working with the career federal staff, uh, uh, mostly with uh, the senior folks who, after you know many decades of being maligned 
to be you know, a taxpayer finance public servants, uh, still to this day uh, are highly professional, deeply committed, hardworking, uh, stand up to political pressure under great duress, um, uh, and, and have a great respect for the laws and statutes that govern that work. You know, the, the, I never saw rogue activity going on. If anything, the political appointees might be pushing the, pushing that, that envelope, and, and, and the career people would say, oh, hold up, you know, here's what we're authorized to do. So thank you for your service. Uh, that, that was one of the, the most uh, hard things about leaving the agency, knowing who was coming in for me was, was leaving behind those folks. But, but it's a great point. You know, the Department of Energy is, is a science agency. Every one of the core missions, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, production management, and nonproliferation, uh, the, the national labs, the applied energy programs, the nuclear waste cleanup program, science and technology is central to every one of those. And, and, and so much of that science um, uh, uh, leads to, other, you know, to, to great things. So one thing to do is every national lab has a technology transfer office or technology transition. Their job is to, is to pay attention to the discoveries that are made in their lab and give thought to which of those should be patented. Because once they're patented, then they can be licensed to American companies or any company and, and therefore get out in the world and help solve problems. And our sense was that those offices were uneven across the labs. The secretary established the first Office of Technology Transition in the Office of the Secretary that then, uh, then worked tightly with those, those, those offices across the labs. But I think an, a, a, an organized effort to focus on, on when discovery science, taxpayer-funded discovery science, whether it's DOE or NASA or DOD or USDA, when it has contributed to the greater good, improving people's lives and safety and, and health and my, you know, livelihoods. I think that could be very cool. Uh, I actually saw a, a, a document that NASA had produced along those lines, uh, you know, where the space program has, has their, their technology advances and breakthroughs have done it. It's, it's very cool. So that's one thing to be done. But you're right. People, you know, they just don't, I mean, I told you the story about, I thought I knew the agency and I worked closely with it in my career only to discover all these cool mission, missions that, that functions. So uh, some kind of, kind of, yeah, and so yeah, science, uh, our DOE has the science board that runs, which is very cool. Uh, Ernie and, and Lynn Orr, the Undersecretary of Science and Energy, organized a, a big, a, 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 what do they call it, a big ideas summit. And each of our, I think, three, three years of our service, where they invited across the national labs Big ideas for for addressing issues and problems, and then they then they uh, they publish the results of that, trying to create excitement. Um, the other thing is government funds all kinds of programs. You know, RPE funds uh, uh, I don't know what the number of, of, of companies in any given cycle is, but companies that have innovative technologies in the clean energy space. Um, that they want to bring to scale and commercialize. And these, these five, ten million dollar grants go an enormous way with these companies and help give them the boost out. So I, I don't have the magic comprehensive answer, but there's, there's a lot of cool stories to be told that we have to figure out how to tell. Uh, you've talked about uh, Interference, congressional interference, political interference, mostly as it affects you know, individual science projects or things of that sort. Uh, another form which I observed when I worked for the Air Force Research Lab, which has several sites, is interference uh, to try and favor one site over another. And you have, a, 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 for example, I don't mean to indict Sandy. But I'll give you an idea. A friend of mine at San Villa once said that we in, in New Mexico are very much aware that if the uh, that if the government 
uh, goes away, that our state will dry up. And uh, and in fact, uh, where the where the Air Force Research Lab was involved, the the senator from New Mexico, one of the senators, was very active. Have you, did you experience this kind of situation? or uh, analogous situations uh, from the top of DOE, and what did you do about it? Uh, I have, have to say all the time. Yeah. And yeah. and uh, that is to say, you know, we were here, and often it was, often it was calls directly to the secretary. Uh, I might get a call from a congressional chief of staff, maybe even a member of Congress, a legislative affairs people would. Uh, and. The, the, the antidote actually is, is this merit review process that's been, been developed over time. That is to say, if we were issuing a contract uh, to run one of our sites or for a major research effort, um, it would, there's this whole uh, mature protocol for issuing the, the request for proposals. Proposals come in, they have a technical review team that's thoughtfully selected. And Shane's Barron is on it, reviews it, uh, and, and, and gives each each bid a, a, a scoring, uh, and so on and so forth, such that the secretary, him or herself, isn't involved in decision making for the vast majority of procurement exercises. Now that's not to say that that an undersecretary, an assistant secretary, or an office director couldn't be influenced. Um, but I, I tell you, certainly on our watch. We had some pretty rough uh, moments when we had to inform a member of Congress who was who was all over us that I'm sorry your you know your candidate isn't going to be funded, uh, but we had we, we had the protection of that formal American <coughs> process and all the associated protocols, and that 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 went a long way. But you know that. Uh, there was a certain New Mexico senator, senior senator, uh, who uh, was uh, the chair of a certain committee uh, in the U.S. Senate for many years, uh, who had enormous ability to, to deliver funds to, to his state, and and uh, that's a, that that could be a pretty withering amount of pressure for for a, a uh, you know for the faint of heart. So it's it. it often comes down to, to the integrity of the decision makers and, frankly, when it's a career federal employee who's under that intense pressure, that they have the wisdom to, to bring it up. But, you know, the, politi the, the political leadership turns over and, you know, so, sometimes they're going to be afraid to bring it up. So it's, it's, it's not perfect, but I'll tell you that in our instance, uh, you know, we took many a call, politely listened, and uh, and then remind reminded the call of uh, the formal process and the distance that we, uh, you know, by by uh, if not statute by 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 policy would, would kept from it. And and uh, other than some, a few uncomfortable uncomfortable moments, uh, that worked well. If you could part that to your legislative aid days, just to help us understand, um, you know, what does a congressman actually hear when it's about time to vote? So after, you know, after you've done all your research and collected the data, collected public opinion, you ran the financial numbers, gotten the, you know, gotten the political gauge on what's going on. You know, when it's actually time for the congressman to vote and it's you know, six minutes away, they don't know much about the policy. What actually gets into their ears? If you could remember maybe one of those speeches you delivered, it kind of delivered. <laughs> That's a great question. I, I, I should amend what I said earlier. If we knew a major vote was coming at us, you know, back in the day it was the Graham Rudman Deficit Reduction Bill, for example, something like that, then we would carve out time on the schedule the week before. You know, we would try to be, do it appropriately. But in the Senate, unlike the House, in the House you have a Rules Committee. Every major legislation is, is given. Uh, the Rules Committee writes a rule for it. You know. Every amendment that's going to be offered, you know how long they're going to debate every amendment, et cetera, before they start taking up that bill. So you have in the House, you have some time to prepare. In the Senate, you, the, the, the rules, other than a few budget rules, uh, 
you can offer an amendment on any topic to any bill at any time. And so that, that made our, our challenge, challenge very, you know, pretty tough. On top of that, um, what was going on every time Senator Worth went to the floor of the Senate or to a committee room for a hearing, he was getting his arm twisted by other senators who had a dog in the fight or by lobbyists. And even when I, I would literally walk him right up to the floor of the, of the Senate chamber, um, I could have gone onto the, onto the floor, but I, when it was a vote, I wouldn't. And he could have, walked, and he could have said, okay, yes, I'm going to vote yes. And by the time his name was called by the clerk, he had been worked over and had a chamber. So that added to the chamber. So what you know what what do we say? So in, in my instance, I would say you know I I have a, a senator to this is what this vote is. So really distilling it down, um, I would say um, he uh, you know and, and as the legislative staff you know you would learn who who he cared about. You know who who are the the Colorado organizations that he was want to know where they stood on this. Who are the big national? And he might have wanted to know how the Union of Concerned Scientists stood on a particular issue. Um, he would want to know what the counter arguments were. So there's another senator too. Um, uh, he would want to know, and we, it was our job to know how he had voted on that issue in the past. Um, he, uh, uh, I think I can say this in the public setting, uh, Sen Senator Worth um, was a consistent opponent of the death penalty but in my experience, every time it was a death penalty vote, he, wanted, he was trying to vote for it because of the Robert Kennedy assassination. And he was a young, a young man. And that seared, you know, he was so upset that, uh, that, that that assassin was living and taking out such a, a you know, tremendous asset to our, to our country and democracy. So, you know, that was a very personal, and that's the other thing is, members of Congress, you know, they have an intellect, intellectual approach, and then they have a gut approach. And so, anyway, the point being, I would I would need to tell him uh, what the what the, the counter arguments were, and uh, and in that case of the death penalty, uh, uh, you know, I think we had that discussion probably multiple times over, over the years I worked with him, usually walking briskly to the floor, and and he he did, he did remain consistent. But the reason that that it's important that they know how they voted before on that issue or a related issue is because that's, that's well, first of all, that's important information. But secondly, that can be used politically against you as flip-flopping and so on. So that would be a piece of information that we get. And then, you know, and any other little bit of information that, you know, you get to know your boss over time um, that I would slip in there in the hopes that that would, that would seal the deal. Last question, and then you can stick around for a bit, right? Afterwards? Yeah. yeah, of course. Hi, so I'll use your word, upset. I'm a science teacher. And you know, just this whole questioning of truth, the twisting of science. Uh, today, uh, the elephant in the room, the commentary on the, the Paris uh, climate agreement. We have uh, fake economics, from what I can tell. One-sided stuff. And who knows? I mean, everybody in the audience was clapping pleasantly, you know. So I've kind of given up on that front. But you're a big advocate. So where do you think we should focus our advocacy at this point? Is there any hope? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Check, check out UCS. It's, and it's not just the Center for Science and Democracy. It's the Climate and Energy Program. Uh, they're on fire. So do check, so to speak. Um, well, first of all, that's, that's you know, uh, there may be a diversity of perspective in the room, but let's, you know, let, let's acknowledge that, you know, today is a day of, of, of great anger and sadness. That our, our president would, would put the lives of of seven billion people at, at risk for the ability of this planet to sustain life, let's say that, and uh, encounter not only the leaders of 194 other nations, but, 
but virtually every major U.S. corporation, uh, science community, um, uh, his own Secretary of State, uh, and, and do such a such a reprehensible reprehensible thing. It, it really is, you know, we we, we stop being shocked, but it, it, it's it's really, you know, truly uh, reckless and, and and sad. Having said that. The answer that I would offer to your question, in addition to general hue and cry, and that don't don't discount that. You know, this is a time to raise hell. Um, but it is on the economy and on innovation, because uh, what has happened over the last five to seven years in the clean energy space. When I say clean energy, I mean renewable energy and energy efficiency, and 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 reducing the carbon footprint of, 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 of fossils, et cetera. What has happened is the cost of those technologies has dropped very sharply. Wind, since 2008, has dropped 41%. Solar, something like 60%. And deployment is way up since 2008. Three times it installed wind capacity uh, of wind and 30 times the installed capacity of solar. One of the things that we did that I'm so excited about over the two Obama terms uh, is that we strengthened 50 energy efficiency goals across heating, cooling, lighting, electronics of all kinds, industrial equipment, and appliances of all kinds. Everything from hot water heaters to refrigerators uh, to pool pumps. It's, it'll be a tremendous legacy. And by the way, the, in, in, the, in the Congress's effort to use the Congressional Review Act to overturn rules, they didn't attempt to overturn our energy efficiency rules. And Trump himself, in, in his noxious executive orders around the Clean Power Plan and fuel efficiency, did not go after the energy efficiency rules. What that does is position American manufacturers to make the most efficient, ultra-efficient stuff on the planet. And those 195 signatories, 194 now, uh, well, 195, of, of, of the Paris Climate Accord, those are 195 markets for our company. So innovation and clean technology is, frankly, it's, 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 it's driving a big slice of our economy. The fastest growing job in the country is wind turbine technician. And if you look at what we discovered that the Bureau of Labor Statistics was not added, they didn't have a methodology for capturing the growth of clean energy jobs. And so we, re we worked with them to, to, to develop a new methodology. We got two of those reports out, 2016, 2017. And it showed a dramatic growth in the number of people involved in, in low carbon activities of various kinds, manufacturing, maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a powerful story. And you saw that in, in the corporations that, that, that appealed, that signed the, the full page New York Times ads and, and, and otherwise spoke out, urging us to stay in Paris Agreement. So it is about innovation. And what I've been saying to, to, to people across the country really is, you know, every state has one or more major research universities. We certainly have, have our share. Many states have a national lab, whether it's a DOE lab, a DOD lab, um, uh, a USDA lab. Uh, many state, well, every state has a major, one or more major corporations that are investing heavily in R&D and in innovation. Uh, let's do with some overlays of all of that, that data along with congressional districts and bang down those doors. And you, you're, you're seeing the, the, the uh, you know, what's happening in these, these district town meetings across, across the country. Uh, I think a version of that, but with, with uh, leaders from the research universities, the national labs, the, the major corporations, small businesses, showing up on their legislative doorstep and saying, this is, this is a massive market opportunity for us. From, you know, we, we, we need to decarbonize the global economy. It's a tremendous opportunity. And on top of that, all of the savings, uh, uh, we project those 50 energy efficiency rules I was talking about, we project by the year 2030, as they're fully implemented, we'll save resi you know, residents uh, and, and, and factories and, and businesses $350 billion uh, cumulatively by that time. And that's money that will be recycled back into the economy, hopefully for, for, uh, 
a good thing. So I think that's, a, to me, and that's, that's my post-DOE life at, at the Fletcher School, uh, I've, I've been focusing on, on that piece of it. Uh, Secretary Moniz just, he, he was trying to be respectful of, of Secretary Perry, given his, his space, but he, when that FY18 budget came out, um, uh, just, early, just early this week, uh, Secretary Moniz put out a statement uh, that was quite hard hitting, but around around this innovation theme, this is that that that, but that proposed budget for DOE would cut uh, innovation, science and technology innovation funding by seventy percent. It's nuts. It's nuts, and it, it cuts to the to the heart and the core of, of our economy. So I think that's that's a that's a winning issue, um, and I think what you're going to see, and we're already seeing it, is is that leadership um, is almost. Redoubling their commitment. I'm talking about corporate leadership, state leadership. Um, uh, 30 states apparently today committed to doing their share to meet our, our Paris commitment. 30 states. That's a lot more than what once was just Massachusetts and California in the, in the climate and clean energy leadership space. All right, so thank you. Oh, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for coming. I'm to tell you that the library closes at 9, so you have to get out of here by then. But Kevin's going to stick around, and if you want to say hello, thank you again for coming in. Our fall slate is filling out, so there will be more Science Cafe. Oh, great. great. All right. Good.